respiratory system. Um, obviously, air moving by bulk flow through the nasal cavity. What's the purpose of the nasal cavity in terms of flow? What have a nose? Yeah, we do breathe through our mouth, right? Okay. Uh, rest, we breathe predominantly through our nose, predominantly. Even light exercise, but once we start getting to a more you know, moderate to heavy exercise, everything's coming into the mouth. So the nose, the nose definitely plays a role. What's that role in terms of air? It's got to build a filtration. Filtration, warming, humidification. Okay. And then, of course, you know we have turn the airflow to the pharynx, larynx, trachea, um, and two main bronchi, and then the bronchioles, and then finally the endpoints, right, the alveoli, where gas exchange is occurring around the individual areoli are the pulmonary capillaries. Okay. In terms of transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide, pulmonary ventilation, this is using in terms of definitions of breathing, movement of air into and out of the lungs, pulmonary diffusion that's occurring at the alveolar capillary membrane, which here we're talking about obviously O2 and CO2. Um, we are going to talk about obviously transport of O2 and CO2 in, in blood, how it does that. Um, Boyle's law, if you remember from physics, okay, is important to us. Temperature is constant, pressure one times volume one equals pressure two times volume two. Basically, in essence, if the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. If pressure goes down, volume goes up. That plays a role in terms of the lungs. We'll see that in a second. Okay. In terms of inspiration, this is an active process. It very much involves the diaphragm. Right? The diaphragm involves a skeletal muscle. The diaphragm can be trained. It thickens with training. Okay? Opera singers, for instance, have very, very, very large diaphragms for obvious reasons. Okay? And so the diaphragm and what we call the external intercostal muscles play very much an active process of inspiration. So the pressure in the lung is less than the air pressure outside the body, air flows down the pressure gradient into the lung. Expiration, uh, the less I force air out deliberately. It's a passive process. Okay. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but basically in terms of inspiration and expiration, what's important about this diagram and you need to understand is that um, if you like, O2 and CO2 move via pressure gradients. Not concentration gradients, right? That's fluids. So air, CO2, O2 moved by pressure gradients. Such so that, for example, um, let's take inspiration. Atmospheric pressure is around 760 millimeters of mercury. In the lung, to get, if you like, to, to inspire, the interpulmonary pressure is 758. Therefore, we have a pressure gradient. Air will flow in. In fact, the intrapleural pressure between the two intrapleural cavities is 754. So it's less in the lung compared to the atmospheric pressure, air will move in. And it's the reverse for expiration. Okay, intrapulmonic pressure, or the pressure in the lung is 763. It's great in atmospheric pressure, air will move out. So air is moving by pressure gradient. Have you done your spirometry lab yet? No, you haven't. Okay. Can we measure lung volumes then in the lab? Yes, we can. Okay. You're going to do a lab on this. Okay. You're going to use spirometry. You're going to use an old method where you use a water, the water bell spirometer, and you're going to get a paper tracing, and you're going to see something like this. But in essence, what you're going to have is someone's going to breathe through a tube. You're going to have this water bell spirometer here going up and down, you're breathing three or four tidal volumes. You see something like this. And then you're going to tell the person to inspire okay, deeply 
across the floor as much as they can, and then force all their air out. You'll see a tracing like this. Okay. So that there is your tidal volume. We'll bring it rest. Okay. And from your forced inspiration to your forced expiration of maximum release, that's your forced vital capacity. And then we can measure off, well you can measure off at a certain point along here, for instance, because that's your expiration part of the curve, you can measure forced expiratory volume in one second, for instance, you can measure in two seconds, you can measure in six seconds, etc. Okay? Forced expiratory volume in one second is used a lot to diagnose obstructive lung disease because you can compare this against normal values. So if you want to diagnose someone with asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis, we use forced expiratory vol volume as a VLV in one second a lot, and that's become the gold standard. Okay? And you'll do better than that. Okay, in terms of pulmonary diffusion, pulmonary diffusion is simply meaning that it, what's occurring in terms of gas exchange down at the alveolar capillary membrane. Is that alveolar? Is that capillary? Obviously, oxygen is moving down into the blood, and CO2 is moving from the blood to the alveolar, being expelled. Okay? We've already spoken about blood flow to the lungs at rest, pulmonary hemodynamics, so I'm not going to talk about this. We've just, we've just spoken about this. So the respiratory membrane or the alveolar, the alveolar capillary membrane, um, the, the membrane between the two, the alveolar, alveolar and capillary, is very, very thin. One layer of endothelial cells. It has to be, right? Because we need to get O2 and CO2 across. And remember, those gases that we're trying to get across, the O2 and CO2, are moving along the gradient based on what we call partial pressures. Partial pressures. And this is just a schematic out of your book, looking at, at that alveolar capillary membrane right here. Okay? And 
for the diffusion CO2 O2 across the membrane. Okay, I do want to talk about partial pressures before we leave today. Okay. So like we've already mentioned, the standard atmospheric pressure at sea level is about 760 millimeters of mercury. Now we can talk about partial pressures because all this the O2, CO2, nitrogen is all moving around these partial pressure gradients in the body. Particular CO2 and O2. Okay. So if you want to work out the partial pressure of oxygen. In inspired air, you need to know the atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, generally, times the percentage of O2 in the air, which is 20.93, right? But we don't express, we don't use, because we're working in decimals, point. really 20.93%, but we don't write it as 20.93%, we write it as 2.2093, which equals, what you got down there, 159.1 millimeters of mercury. So that's the partial pressure of O2 in inspired air at sea level. Okay? You, would, you can work it out CO2 as well. Partial pressure of CO2 in this fine air is 760 times 0.003. Comes out 0.2 millimeters of mercury in the same form of nitrogen. You can do it for any of these gases. Okay? This guy here never changes. So if you, if you go to the top of Mount Everest or K2, the percentage of oxygen in the air is exactly the same. What changes is him. partial pressure than the other. The atmospheric pressure changes based on elevation. So we'll come back to that again when we talk about altitude physiology. So if you're in um, I've been in Colorado for many years, right? Boulder. So the atmospheric pressure in Boulder, Colorado is about 560 millimeters of mercury. Give or take times 0.2093 that comes down to like, I don't know, 113, something like that. I don't know what might be wrong, but certainly less than this guy, right? That's the PO2 of inspired air in Colorado, which is say at 5,000 feet. That's why it's harder to breathe at altitude. Because the partial pressure of inspired air, of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen inspired air is a lot less than the sea level. So it's important to understand, it's not the percentage of oxygen in the air that changes, it's the atmospheric pressure. Okay? Okay. Partial pressures and gas exchange in the lung and tissues. So, we've got a PO2, for instance, of O2 um, in the air at sea level, say, of 159 millimeters of mercury. Okay. By the time we get down to the alveola, that PO2 has dropped down to about 105. So we were 159, now we're 105 in the alveola, in the lungs. So there's a pressure gradient, there's a pressure gradient, right? Okay, so we're moving in that direction. And in the pulmonary vein, going to the left atrial ventricle, PO2 is now 100. So there's a slight pressure drop again. CO2 is about 40 millimeters of mercury. So this is at rest at sea level. That's atrium ventricle, nothing changes, or in the systemic arteries, the PO2 in the blood is 100 in mercury, the CO2 is 40. So we get down to the muscle, that's where gas exchange is occurring. Okay? We're going to offload O2, pick up CO2. So we've offloaded 60 millimeters of mercury drop the PO2 in the systemic arteries to a PO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury in the systemic veins. We picked up 6 millimeters of mercury of CO2. We were 40, and now we picked up 6. 
goes back to the right atrium the ventricle, eventually back to the lung, where we're going to offload the six millimeters of mercury CO2, and we're going to pick up 16 millimeters of mercury, actually 65 of O2. That's the circuit. That's what's occurring at rest at sea level. Obviously, if you were exercising, what would happen to PO2? You'd extract more oxygen, right? So it might be that your PO2 may decrease down to 20, and your PCO2 may rise to 48. Okay, fixed law of diffusion really is talking about the diffusion of gases across that respiratory membrane in the lung, okay, or what I like to call it, I like to call it the alveolar capillary membrane, or the book calls it the respiratory membrane. So here's the membrane, this is the schematic, right, there's a pressure drop across it. So the volume of gas that we get across that membrane is dependent upon some factors. It's dependent upon the surface area available for gas exchange, the diffusion coefficient of the gas, that particular gas, whether it's O2 or CO2, and the diffusion coefficient equals the solubility of the gas divided by the molecular square root of the molecular weight of the gas times partial pressure gradient, okay, and it's all divided by the thickness of the membrane. So the volume of gas is proportional to the surface area times the diffusion coefficient times partial pressure, but it's inversely proportional to the thickness. So, for example, if you take a big, big, deep inspiration, right, you're going to increase the volume of gas you're going to get across. Why? Because you've increased the surface area. You've expanded your alveoli. So you've got the capillaries surrounding the alveoli, you've expanded that surface area, you get more gas across. If you increase the partial pressure, the driving pressure, you're going to get more gas across. So if you decrease the partial pressure gradient, because your altitude, because you, your, your partial pressure gradient has gone down, because the inspired CO2 has gone down, then you're going to run into problems. If you decrease the partial pressure gradient, like you do on altitude, the volume of gas you're going to get across is less. You increase the thickness of this. Logically, you can do that um, with, the, with the patients with, uh, let's say, cystic fibrosis or a fibrotic lung. That thickness can increase. That compromises the volume of gas that gets across. Diffusion coefficient. Um, we'll come, let me just hold on to this platform for a second. So O2 could get across this, this gap, this, this membrane very easily because there's a big partial pressure gradient, there's a big partial drive of O2. Okay? CO2, if you remember, at rest there's 60 millimeters of mercury difference, wasn't there? Right? You go back to this across here. Okay. 40 to 100. There's a 60 millimeter difference. O2 can move very, very easily across that membrane. There's only six for CO2. So there's a small partial pressure drive for CO2. So CO2 has more difficult time in terms, of, certainly in terms of a partial pressure gradient to get across. However, it wins out because CO2 is 20 times more soluble than O2. Remember that, okay? CO2 is 20 times more soluble than O2. That's how it, that's how it can get across that respiratory membrane very low partial pressure gradient. Remember, gases move up like partial pressure gradients. It's 100, there's a 60 at rest for O2, and only 6 for CO2. Okay, I think I just want to... This slide here, this, this is it, the last one. This is just you here, this is from your, um, your book. This is just looking at partial pressure gradients the different gases in dry air, alveolar air, arterial blood, venous blood, and the diffusion of the okay? 
and on, on Wednesday we will kick off with uh, this one. Okay. okay, we're done. We do open up the capillaries in the upper part of the lung, so we get in increased diffusion of blood flow in the upper regions of the lung due to exercise. So that's a good thing, okay? But at rest, most of those capillaries are closed, and we've got most of our blood diffusion happening in the lower extremities of the lung. Okay, but as we exercise, we open those up and we get greater diffusion. That's really what that is talking about there. Um, Okay, uptake of oxygen into the pulmonary capillary. Um, what we're going to talk about now basically is mean transit time of a red blood cell through a pulmonary capillary. Okay, so what we have is our pulmonary capillary, here's our arterial end, and now here's our venous end. Obviously, here's the alveoli right here. The gas exchange is obviously occurring across this membrane. Okay, we're picking up O2, onloading CO2. So as the red blood cells entering, we've got a PO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. As you know, by the time it leaves the red the capillary, we've got a PO2 of 105, and it's picked up around about 60, 65 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. Okay. For that red blood cell to become fully saturated, so what this graph is showing, we've got blood PO2 here and time on the x-axis, it takes about 0.25 of a second, quarter of a second for that red blood cell, for all that hemoglobin to be fully saturated with oxygen. Okay? At, this is at rest, you guys sitting there at the moment. Okay? On average, it takes about a quarter of a second for your red blood cell, which is basically a bag full of hemoglobin, to become fully saturated with oxygen. And after that, you cannot take on any more fully saturated and we have this flat line here. And by three quarters of a second that red blood cell has gone through. Okay? What do you think happens as we start to exercise in terms of how quickly that red blood cell obviously traverses through that capillary? It increases, right? So even though the shape of that curve may stay the same, as we start to ex exercise, you start to see that saturation point move to the right. Okay? Such that light exercise, you may have a saturation point of around about, say, a third of a second. Because it's moving quicker. It's moving quicker. That rubber blood cell is moving quicker. Okay? Basically, that's, a, that's what that's showing, the mean pulmonary capillary oxygen muscle pressure. And of course, as we start to exercise, that curve will start to change a little bit. Now, this is a similar curve, we've got partial pressure at the time in the capillary right here. Here's in red, okay, in red, is that curve that we just sh showed. Now, We've got a curve here, a Mo curve, that says O2 abnormal. And as you can see, there is no, there is no full saturation of the red blood cell with oxygen. Even at 0.75 of a second, when it leaves the capillary, the partial pressure of oxygen is less than what we'd have for a normal curve. And there's cases when that can occur. Pulmonary disease, Okay, some types of pulmonary disease. And believe it or not, in some elite athletes. There are some elite athletes out there, particularly runners, and it's just prevalent in females as well as males, <coughs> and we term that exercise-induced arterial hypoxemia. In the books or in literature, you see it written as EIH, exercise-induced hypoxemia, or exercise-induced arterial hypoxemia, which means that their red blood cells or hemoglobin never become fully saturated. So if you measure their saturations, their O2 sats in the lab, rather than being around about 
which is what we would be, a normal person, normal athlete, right? These guys can drop, their stats can drop down to 85, say on average, 85%, which is a dramatic decrease. Okay, the question is why? Why would that occur? <coughs> why do we not see a curve like this? Why would, why would we see a curve kind of like this? Got to do. Go ahead. Well, didn't you say that exercise increases the the graph just like that, anyways? Didn't you say uh, that moves it to the right? It moves it to the right, not necessarily so severely. Okay. Right. So let's say with um, just a normal recreational athlete, even a heavy exercise. Okay. You may see something like that. So even though not 0.25 a second, but say half a second or 0.6 of a second, they're still fully saturated. And they're fine. There's no comp they're not compromised. What did I say about some of the athletes for their cardiac outputs? They can reach 40 liters per minute. 35 to 40 liters per minute per minute. So their red blood cells reversing so quickly that their cardiac outputs are so high that the red blood cell simply doesn't have time to pick up all the oxygen. The hemoglobin picks up all the oxygen, okay? So their sats drop down because the curve is doing this. Okay? So it's due primarily to very high pulmonary transit types, red blood cells. Okay? And it's been termed exercise induced arterial hypoxemia. Their O2 sats drop from around 98%, can be down to 85% in severe cases. The question is, if that occurs then, does this compromise exercise performance? It doesn't seem to. These guys are elite athletes. It doesn't seem to compromise their performance. So it's a phenomenon that occurs in a, in a percentage of elite athletes that does not seem to um, be detrimental to exercise performance, as far as we know. And it is just as prevalent in the females as in males. Okay. And we've tested a lot of athletes in the lab for this, um, particularly with the cross-country running cross-country team. And probably about 70% of the uh, lead cross-country team here, i.e. cross-country team, have arterial ex exercise to hypoxemia. Okay. Okay, so that's just the normal key points there. So you can go through those. Right. Oxygen transport. Let's talk about oxygen transport. How is oxygen transport? Well, I've kind of already mentioned it. You should probably already know. It's bound to hemoglobin. <coughs> right? What's hemoglobin? Obviously, finding red blood cells, right?
draw hemoglobin? Iron? Yeah. Yeah. You haven't used notice of the exam, but basically it's made up of uh, side chains. And now, and now, and the data proteins, right? With iron. And what else? Does it have anything else? Heme as well. Okay. And there's four of these, isn't there? And what does oxygen bind to? The iron, right? So, obviously, if you're low in red blood cells, you're low in hemoglobin. If you're low in hemoglobin, you're going to be low in your oxygen carrying capacity in the blood, right? Obviously, it would make sense. Okay. Increased or low pH and temperature of the muscle okay, facilitates oxygen unloading in the muscle. And guess when that occurs during exercise? That's a good thing. You need that. Okay? <coughs> a low pH, a higher temperature that occurs during exercise will facilitate unloading of oxygen from hemoglobin into the muscle and into the mitochondria. Okay? Okay, you may or may have not seen this curve before, the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. Okay, what we got here is a graph of the percent of oxygen saturation to hemoglobin, or the percent of oxygen hemoglobin saturation. And how much oxygen is bound into hemoglobin? And that's a percentage. And as you know, at rest, sitting there at sea level, you're around about 98% saturated. And that's going to differ at altitude, right? And this is graphed up against partial pressure of O2 in millimeters of mercury. And there's a sigmoidal relationship between the two. Okay. So, you know, we well should know now, you certainly need to know from the exam, right? But what is the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, because we went through it on Monday. And we usually donate it big P, small a, O2. Partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. So just as it's leaving the pulmonary capillary, in millimeters of mercury, also the PO2. Right 
as we start to move down and get into low PO2s, we get a sharp decline in the percent of oxygen hemoglobin saturation. So this is our sigmoidal relationship. And as you can see, this part of the curve here, actually, it's actually truly a little bit flatter than this. This is the protective part of the curve. So even though we're dropping down quite severely in PO2, so if, for instance, a PO2 of, uh, let's say I use the example of 85% of these elite athletes with exercise due to hypoxemia. Okay. They're still doing okay in terms of saturation. So the higher PO2s, this is the protective part of the curve, we're not too bad. So only when we get down to very, very low PO2s, we start climbing to the top of Mount Everest, that our percent hemoglobin saturation falls dramatically. Okay. Um, on the right side here is the oxygen content of the blood in ml for over 2 to per 100 milliliters of blood in the, uh, in the tissues. It's the amount of O2 of low to low, low, low to the tissue. So like we said, we have 20 entering the tissues and say, for example, um, leaving the tissues, we're, we're left with about 15 milliliters of O2 per 100 milliliters of blood. Okay, so that's where obviously we're leaving. Okay, so if you can't visualize this too well, we're talking about, obviously, right here, right? That's arterial blood and that's the human blood. We've got a PO2 of 100, right? And here we've got a PO2 of 40. And we're 75% saturated right here, and we're leaving. Okay, now we're entering we're about 100% saturated. And that value up there, 20 mL per O2 per 100 milliliters of blood, is right here, again, 15, right here. That's the muscle. Okay? So we're offloading O2, sinking up to the ceiling. But at the moment, we're only talking about oxygen what we're talking about CO2. Okay? So visually, that's what we're talking about. Okay, okay so that's called the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. We will see it again. Okay? So you need to become familiar with that. That's, that's right out of your textbook. So you can read a chapter in the textbook on that. The question is, can the shape of what you can, can this curve change due to exercise? Yes, it can. Okay? So like we said, you increase, for instance, temperature, or if you increase CO2 in the blood, you decrease pH, that can shift the curve. And it shifts it to the right. So what we're going to see on the next slide is, well, we can talk about those things now. If it moves to the right, we call that the bore shift, named after a famous phys British physiologist, right? The bore shift. Decreased pH, or an increased hydro protons, increased temperature, and increased PCO2. Which happens during exercise, shifts the curve to the right. A left shift, hard end shift, are the conditions opposite of the right shift. So, we see something like this. <coughs> Here's our control curve we've just seen, right? So with exercise, we see a shift to the right. With the left shift, obviously we're going to the left, and the conditions are opposite to the right shift. So with the right shift, then we see increased temperature. We're going to talk about increased 2, 3 dpg, which was discussed in a second, and increased iron ions, and also increased PCO2 which are all things that happen during exercise. The question is, what does that do? If you take, if you move the curve to the right, what's that doing to oxygen? I mean, you can take any point on this curve and say, okay, what's it doing to oxygen? So let's say you take that point there, because it's around about 60 and 30. It doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter where you pick. If I move the curve to the right, okay, 
or I can go this way. So let's take this, let's take, let's take this one. What's it doing to the percent of oxygen work and saturation? Intuitive. Is that intuitive? Do you think that would occur? Yeah, of course it occurs, right? Because you're unloading O2. You're reducing the affinity of oxygen with hemoglobin. So you're facilitating unloading to the muscle. O2 affinity for hemoglobin. Okay? With a left shift, you're seeing tighter binding between O2 and hemoglobin. Okay? Um, in these conditions here for this right shift, you can add CO2, an increase in CO2 to this as well, is um, this increased 2,3 DPG diphosphoglycerate. It's found in glycolysis. Um, it's an intermediate. It's found in red blood cells. Okay, it's found in red blood cells. And that increases. Okay, it increases right with shift or during exercise. Okay. Basically, without reading all this through, it upregulates the release of the remaining oxygen molecules bound to the so it facilitates the breaking of the hemoglobin oxygen bond. Okay, and it happens obviously in red blood cells. So you see an increased temperature, increased T3 PG, increased protons, and increased PCO2. Okay, cause the right shift of the curve to the face unloading oxygen to the muscle. Okay. That's oxygen. How about carbon dioxide? Well, the most carbon dioxide is a little bit different. 60 to 70 percent of carbon dioxide is bound by carbon ions. Okay, 7 to 10 percent is dissolved in blood plasma, and about 20 to 30 percent, 33 percent is bound, actually bound also to hemoglobin. But the majority is bound as it, it's formed as by carbon ions. So what we have occurring in the muscle, we have. At the increase in CO2 and, and um, H2O, we need to get rid of the CO2. That combined with H2O becomes carbonic acid. Okay, carbonic acid. And that could be further um, broken down to hydrogen and bicarbonate right here, HCO3. That is what is moving through blood back to the lung. Okay. And when we're at the lung, we have a reverse formation ending up with back with CO2 and H2O, and then of course the CO2 can be released. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that, but this class, that's all you really need to know, okay? But for bicarbonate ion, is, but for primarily carbon dioxide is bound to bicarbonate ion, and um, we have about 60% of that, okay? Okay, so those are the key points. Gas exchange. 
Um, in terms of gas exchange of the muscles, this is, this, this is out of your textbook here. We have an artery here. We've already mentioned these values before. Okay, here's the artery, here's the capillary, here's the vein. We have 20 mL of O2 per 100 milliliters of blood. And if we're at rest, right, if we're at rest, we've got about 15 to 16 mL of O2 per 100 milliliters of blood leaving in the veins. And remember, this is about 75% saturated, right? Which means you've offloaded about four or five mL of O2 per 100 milliliters of blood. It's obviously just simply the difference. And we call that the AVO2 difference, the arterial venous oxygen difference. B here is simply showing what occurs during exercise. We've still got 20 mL of O2 per 100 milliliters of blood, because that's about 100% saturated, and even over it, right? That does not change. Exercise conditions will not change that. Altitude will, exercise won't. Okay? What will change is how much you've obviously extracted from the blood. So in this case, we've extracted 15 nL of O2 per 100 ml of blood because our muscles demand it, right? And we're left with 5 nL of O2 per 100 ml of blood, meaning that our, obviously our AVO2 difference is 15. We've just simply extracted more. Okay? So that's termed the arterial, arterial venous oxygen difference. We'll see it again in the next lecture. Um, another graph I have a textbook here, a similar graph to before the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Here's the hemoglobin. And now we've drawn on another one called myoglobin. Does anyone know what myoglobin is? It's obviously a protein. And it's found in muscle. Okay, it's found in muscle. It also binds oxygen, so it's found in tissues, it binds oxygen, and you can see that it's got a similar sort of shape to the oxyhemoglobin association curve, but it will only let go of its oxygen, as you can see, because here's the protected part of the curve, right? It will only let go of its oxygen at very, very, very low partial pressures of oxygen, right down here, and around about probably 17, uh, millimeters of mercury and beyond and below it starts releasing its oxygen. So it's a reserve protein. It's found in tissues. It will start to let go of its oxygen at very, very low partial pressures. So when you're at severe altitude like Mount Everest, K2, whatever, okay, you're down at very, very low O2, O2, PO2s, myoglobin will kick in and start to release the oxygen. And it's also a carrying molecule, okay? So that oxygen is transported from the muscle into the mitochondria by myoglobin. It's a very, very important protein. So it binds the oxygen, it's a shuttling protein as well, and it transports the oxygen from the muscle to the mitochondria where obviously we need it to oxidate the phosphorylation. would affect how much you can extract. <coughs> the blood flow, the more blood flow you've got, the more red blood cells you've got to the site, the, the tissue bed, the more heat, the more red blood cells, the more hemoglobin, more oxygen. And local conditions with the muscle where you're basically restricted and raised and dilated would all play a role. Okay. Um, that's a key point again. I kind of want to end on, on this lecture anyway, the regulation of, of pulmonary ventilation. How pulmonary ventilation, breathing, right, regulated. It's regulated by what we call the higher brain centers. 
we kind of already mentioned these before a little bit, the expiratory sensors and the inspiratory sensors. Chemoreceptors, <coughs> which can monitor changes in pH, PO2, PCO2. Mechanoreceptors, located in the muscles and the lung muscles, so the active muscles or the lung muscles, you know, actually stress receptors. It's hypothalamic input, which we've discussed. And it's also conscious control, and that's through the cerebral motor cortex. Because I can obviously deliberately increase or, you know, my, my rate of breathing if I need to. Okay? So, this is actually out of your book here. So what we have is kind of just putting it all together in the schematic form. Number one here, you should be showing, here's the brain, here's the brain stem, and located in the middle of the medulla of the propaganda um, region, we have the inspiratory center and the expiratory center. Some of the information we've already discussed is coming into the inspiratory center of things like information from those central chemoreceptors, and there's information coming from the peripheral chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors are located in the cerebrospinal fluid, Okay? And they are transmitting information about peak partial pressure of CO2 and pH. We've got peripheral chemoreceptors located in blood vessels, monitoring changes of PO2, PCO2, and again pH. We've got information coming from the active muscles and those stress receptors, for instance. And what's coming out of the inspiratory center in terms of do we need to increase the rate of breathing, for instance, that information is going obviously from the afferent nerves down to the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. It contracts all the time. Okay, so we've got information coming from the inspiratory center to the diaphragm in terms of contraction. Also, we've got information going to the external intercostal muscles. These muscles here are primarily involved, as we discussed before, with inspiration, right? The diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So we've got information coming into the inspiratory center. Okay, that's determining what needs to be done, sending information out by aferent nerve fibers to the muscles. Expiratory center is kind of similar. Information that's coming in is it's coming in from the lung stress receptors and information you know, going out towards the abdominal and the internal intercostal muscles, for instance. As you know, that's more um, expiration is more of a passive process until we start to exercise. Okay, pulmonary ventilation then. Um, have you done a lab yet on ventilation? You yeah. have? Okay, so you are you familiar with that equation there? Minute ventilation equals tidal volume times breathing frequency. Are you familiar with that? No? Don't discuss that. Okay. So ventilation then, right? Simple pulmonary ventilation, which would denote VE, okay? and expressed in liters per minute VE with a dot flow rate equals tidal volume usually in liters times breathing frequency so I usually denote it like this breathing frequency okay rest per minute So if you increase tidal volume or increase breathing frequency, you're obviously going to increase the ventilation which occurs to you and then as you start to exercise, right? Okay. Anatomic dead space. Another term you need to become familiar with. This is the air that fills the nose, mouth and the trachea in. Okay, the upper airways and is not involved in gas exchange down at the alveolar. So we call it dead space air. Dead space ventilation is not involved in uh, gas exchange. It averages around about 150 to 200 milliliters. Okay. Therefore, if we've got 500 milliliters coming in through our, tidal, through our tidal volume, in fact, you subtract off the dead space, there are only about 500 to 350 milliliters of that 500 milliliter tidal volume enters the alveoli and can partake in gas exchange. <coughs> So you may take in 500 milliliters, but only 350 of that is getting down to the alveoli. Okay? okay. 
obviously, if you increase your tidal volume, breathe more and heavier and deeper, that was obviously more effective alveolar ventilation, which is going down, obviously, the alveolar, okay? You're increasing your bed space. So you're increasing the amount of air getting to the alveolar, I should say. So you're not increasing bed space. Okay. So, um, so ventilation and the movement of air into the lung, into and from the lung by the process we call bulk flow. There's that equation I just written up on the board again. Okay. So for rest conditions, for you guys sitting there at the moment, this is me rambling on. Okay. On average, you're breathing probably about 12 breaths per minute. For a tidal volume, how much air you're taking in of half a litre, 0.5 of a litre. So your minute ventilation is around six litres per minute. Okay? 12 times 0.5. You're exercising a VO2 max, maximal exercise. Obviously, your rest per minute, your breathing frequency is going to go up, right? So let's uh, use I'll just put a number in here, let's say 60 breaths per minute. Your tidal volume has also gone up. You're breathing deeper, taking more air in. Okay? Let's say you've gone up to 3 litres. So now, your minute ventilation is 180 litres per minute. Okay, that's it. That's fairly easy to work out. Okay? What's, going, what's occurring then down at the alveolar line? Remember, this is the volume of fresh air that reaches the respiratory zone of the lung, what you like the alveoli, the alveoli capillary membrane. Okay. Again, it's expressed in liters per minute. We express it as a V, it's actually could be a V dot A, dot A, alpha mean alveolar. Okay. So now we've got VA equals frequency, just like before, three the frequency press per minute times time volume. But now we're sort of subtracting off the atomic dead space because that's not involved in gas exchange. So again, for normal breathing conditions, we've got VA equals 12 breaths per minute, just like before, times one, minus the anatomic dead space. That's not reaching the gas, the, the um, alveolar respiratory, the alveolar covering membrane. Now it's 12 times 0.85, which equals 10.2 liters per minute. That's occurring down with the alveolar. Just to use another example, what, what, what's happening then for sh rapid shadow breathing conditions? You're hyperventilating, like this, okay? Well, your breathing frequency has obviously gone up. You've gone up to 60 breaths per minute. Your tidal volume's gone down, right? And rather than say, breathing normally, like I am now, now I'm going, it's rapid shallow breaths. So my tidal volume's gone down, okay? Now it's 0.2 minus 0.15, and it's 60 times 0.05. So now my alveolar ventilation is 3 liters per minute. I'm not as effective with my alveolar, alveolar vent ventilation with rapid shallow breathing like this as I am opposed to you just sitting there and taking deeper breaths. <coughs> I think this is the last slide for this um, lecture here. Respiratory limitations to performance is what I want to finish up on. Um, the respiratory muscles, the highly metabolic muscles, particularly the diaphragm. I mentioned the diaphragm before, right? We can change the diaphragm, the size of the diaphragm. We can even change the fiber type because it's a skeletal muscle. Opera singers, I use the example of opera singers have very, very large diaphragms because they're using them so much, okay? They're training their diaphragms. Um, Exercise, endurance training in particular, will increase the size of the diaphragm. Okay. Um, respiratory muscles may use up to 11% of the total oxygen consumed during heavy exercise. That's a lot. And seem to be more resistant to fatigue during long-term activity than muscles of the extremities. It's, we've, done, we've done studies here looking at the diaphragm when we determined that up the diaphragm only starts to fatigue after about 92% of VO2 max. It's highly resistant. It's highly resistant. Fatigue resistant. Okay. Another way of uh, 
becoming more efficient and training the, the inspiratory muscles, the respiratory muscles. You may have heard about is to use inspiratory muscle training. We've done studies here on that as well. Um, and that seems to also um, not only increase the size of the diaphragm, we're not sure about fiber typing, but certainly can increase the actual size of the diaphragm, but it can also increase um, time trial performance in the elite cyclists. So it, it does work. Um, I'll put it number two here, pulmonary ventilation is usually not a limiting factor for, for, for performance, even during maximal effort, though it can limit performance of highly trained people. This is how we detect it is wrong. Okay, the, the reason it's wrong is that it's talking about um, exercise induced arterial hypoxemia. I've already discussed that it doesn't seem to compromise exercise performance and it doesn't. Okay. There's no conclusive proof at all that exercise induced hypoxemia limits performance. Even though the saturated down before right going down to about 85%, it's something fully happens. But number three, airway resistance gas diffusion usually do not limit performance in normal, healthy individuals that have normal or obstructive respiratory systems can limit performance. What it means by that, in, for example, would be exercise-induced asthma. Exercise-induced asthma is an obstructive lung disease. So if you have airway narrowing that occurs in the bronchioles in asthmatic individuals as they exercise, that does limit performance. Because it compromises, obviously, it compromises gas exchange across the alveolar capillary membrane, right? Because you've got a narrowing of the airway, so you've got a bronchoconstriction occurring. Okay? So that's what put it number two talks about. And there's other obviously respiratory disorders, COPD, cystic fibrosis, etc. Et okay, um, let's take a five-minute break.